So first, we'll start with a show of hands. Who here has heard about Devmetrics or metrics.debian.net already? Wow, that's a lot more than I thought. <laughs> um, so about Devmetrics, the first question you probably have is, what is Devmetrics? Devmetrics is a software powering metrics.debian.net. It is an interface for adding new metrics. There are two types of metrics. Pull metrics run as a script locally on the Devmetrics server. They pull data from some source. Push metrics run as on, uh, on some remote server and send data to the metric server via HTTP POST request. Metrics are defined by a manifest file. The manifest file um, contains all sorts of data about a metric. To add a new metric, you should submit a patch uh, to me or the QA mailing list. The patch should add a manifest file and also a pull script if the metric is a pull metric. Devmetrics is also a web interface for viewing graphs and tables. The graphs and tables are dynamic through the use of JavaScript. The graphs can be overlaid and the tables can be sorted ascending or descending by each column. If the JavaScript is disabled, static matplotlib graphs are used along with static tables. If JavaScript is enabled, the graphs can be overlaid and the tables can be uh, and sorted ascending and descending by each column. Why Devmetrics? Devmetrics provides a universal interface to metrics. This is useful because statistics are scattered all over the place. A universal interface allows metrics to be compared in ways that are not possible if the metrics are scattered. A universal interface also makes backing up data easier because there is a single location to back up data from. Um, these are the technologies that Devmetrics uses. You can read the list yourself. Um, jQuery plugins. jQuery UI is used by dynamic interface for some UI elements. A number of jQuery plugins are used by Flot. Hidden graphs uh, and Flot's used to generate the dynamic graphs. Hidden graphs is used to show hide the series on the graph. Time allows your time to be plotted on the x-axis. Tooltip allows for displaying the data related to the point when the user mouses over a point on the graph. And Super Legends is a plugin that I wrote and it allows multiple metrics to be added to the graph while placing a heading for each metric in the legend to keep the series that belong to each metric separate from the rest. You can see in the picture the red X's that let you delete the, um, delete the metrics and the labels uh, listing the metric names that are added by that plugin. The current metrics. Uh, this is the list of the current metrics that are available at metrics.debian.net. And if you keep listening, you'll find out how to add your own metric. Hacking on dev metrics. Um, this is how you hack on dev metrics. Um, I'm going to skip over that. How to add a new metric. You need to add a manifest file to the manifest directory. If the metric is a pull metric, you should add a pull script to the pull scripts directory. If the metric is a push metric, you should add a push script to the remote server. You add a cron job to the server to run the script every so often. You can also add a custom graph script to the graph scripts directory if you wish, but it's optional. Um, the graph script allows you to make a graph other than the vault time series graph. At this time, the, graph, uh, the custom graph scripts are not supported. What I mean by that is they won't display in the web interface. Uh, this is an example manifest file. Um, the manifest always starts off with script one. Originally, I planned for more than one script per manifest, so that is why there is a one. The type is push or pull. Freak is the frequency to run the script at. It is in crontab format. Script is the location of the pull script to run. Right now, it, is not, um, it does not work, so you have to make the name of the pull script and the manifest match. Fields are the name and type of each field in the database. The names must be valid Python names. You don't need to include TS because TS is automatically added unless override TS is true. What TS is is its time series. Um, format is the format in which data is returned by the script. Delete before insert being true means that data is deleted from the database before each new time new data is inserted. Graph type determines what type of graph is generated. Right now, it's just default or custom. Default being a time series line graph, and custom being the graph script in the graph scripts directory. 
And description is just, is, uh, just the description uh, that gets displayed in the web interface. This is an example script. You can read through that. and um, So it just writes data to sys.standard out. It writes the headers first. And then it writes the actual data. Um, we have a to-do list there, and um, these are a list of some of the items that we have to do still. The make portable themable to-do item means that we want to make the portable themable so that you could replace the um, like the Debian logo with your own logo so that other organizations can use this too. Um, to contact us, use Debian QA mailing list or Debian QA on OFTC. Um, and now I'm going to show you the metrics. This is what you see when you first um, open up the Metrics website. It's the static interface. Um, it lists the metrics, the description of the metrics. So if I click on one like VCS, that provides statistics on the number of packages using each version control system. So you see a graph here. Then there's the download CSV link that lets you uh, play around with the data. And then there's all the data in the table. And finally, there's some statistics, mean, standard deviation, min, max. If we go up here, click on dynamic. This is the dynamic interface. We could select something like VCS, add metric to graph. It displays a graph, and it lets you mouse over and see the data points. Show metric and table displays a table. And um, that's about it. Any questions? Yeah. Um, in adding new metrics, is there any thought of uh, how much resources can be taken care of? Are you expecting a, a new metric to be collected, something that's already more or less table format, or is it viable to go and do the analysis with the script that you write? Um, Would it be okay for a script to take an extended period of time to run? Uh, and it, it could, could there or is there a working area that script could use for processing data as it comes in? Uh, no, there's no working area. Um, and as far as time, um, I'm not really sure. I have an application which would need to be right, right. So if it's something, no, no, it's pull and push with respect to the infrastructure. So if it's something very easy to compute, the idea is that the infrastructure running the metrics will do the computation. If it's something which is very, very uh, resource intense to compute, you will do that elsewhere and just push the results to the metric infrastructure. I need mean elsewhere. That's not the solution you're looking for. Okay. But actually, in the Debian community, we already have plenty of statistics that already have those elsewhere. We just wanted to have a single place where to centralize the data. So okay. that's a kind of a different problem. Um, OK, so um, in the script you showed us, um, you had the time something, time property, like it was zero, zero, uh, asterisk, asterisk. Uh, what does that exactly mean? Zero, zero, asterisk. Yeah. Oh, um. oh, there it is. That's just contact Correct. format, so it means that it's going to run every day. Um, so uh, you're going to let the person who writes the script decide this, or...? Uh, yes, so they decide it by putting in the manifest whatever Okay, so uh, why are five uh, numbers there? It's quantum format. Okay, I see, okay. Um, and if, for example, if I want to add a new um, dub metric, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm currently porting from Ubuntu the review and rating server um, for packages. Uh, so it's just uh, ratings for packages, five stars, uh, stuff like that. Um, can I integrate it with this? Um, so if it's Ubuntu, um, that wouldn't be part of the metrics. No, no, I'm porting, I'm porting from Ubuntu to Debian with Debian specific. Oh, okay. So if it's Debian metrics, then you could uh, add that to the Deb metrics, um, the metrics.debian.net website. Um, so you could certainly add that. Uh, so what's what's the process to um, upload the new Deb metrics? Do you need to accept it into the project, or anyone can add their own Deb metrics? Because I can't really. I think uh, it's if you're a Debian developer, right? Um, if you're a Debian developer, you could add your own by um, committing to the QA repository. Okay. Okay. So I understand. Thanks. So, are there any more questions? Well, then thank you very much, Joseph. So, the next presentation will be by Juliana on WebRTC. Any help here? I'm not sure how to fit this on. There we go. Uh, hope this stays on. I don't think I'm putting it on right, but okay. I think that's good. Okay. All right. Um, just a second. Um, all right. So uh, my work on Google Summer of Code 2014 was developing the Debian Web RTC portal. Uh, before I start, just a sort of preface, uh, I'd like to ask anyone who would like to demo the, the portal, JS Communicator, at rtc.debian.org. Basically, anyone with an rtc.debian.org account can demo this. However, your passwords may have been changed recently, so if you haven't updated them since uh, January, if you access db.debian.org, you should change your password. It'll take like 30 seconds. This is if you want to go ahead and start checking it out during my presentation. That said, um, so is everyone here familiar with what WebRTC is? More or less, please or more. All right, well, uh, WebRTC it enables browsers to perform real-time communication using a very simple JavaScript API. What's cool about this, about this uh, browser-to-browser communication, uh, one, is that it's really high performance, low latency, and also it's um, a lot safer because you don't need to install anything, you don't need to use a plugin, download anything, so, and by standard it uses the secure real-time transportation protocol. So I've seen it being heralded as like the most secure alternative for voice over IP. Yes? Uh, are you talking about speech? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, well, that's the very high-level explanation of what WebRTC is being used for. So, JS Communicator is what I've been working on. It's a web app that's uh, used for SIP communication. It's developed entirely in HTML5 and JavaScript, and we use the, the JS SIP uh, stack. So JS SIP is a JavaScript library that it implements the SIP WebSocket transport. So uh, to use JS Communicator, you're going to need a server with a SIP proxy that supports um, 
WebSocket transportation. Uh, an example of this, not here, is Camellio, also um, Reciprocate, which is very easy to install in any Debian system. So JS Communicator right now, it's being used, uh, like I said, at rtc.debian.org. Uh, a very light modified version in freephonebox.net. There you don't even need to log in and it's only used for calls. There's a Drupal pl plugin for any Drupal site. And recently I wrote an XTOPL extension for JS Communicator which shows how easy it is to integrate JS Communicator into another web app or a uh, web page. So uh, what's so special about JS Communicator? Uh, in my opinion, it's that it's so simple. JS Communicator is modular. It's very easy to integrate with another product, with another application, which I tried recently, and it turned out it was easier than I, even I had thought. This is my recipe for setting up JS Communicator. It's really quite simple. You need a web browser with RTC support. Uh, that's advocated as Chrome, Chrome Firefox, and Opera. So Chromium, I've tested Chromium. Chromium seemed to work fine. Iceweasel, we've been having a bit of trouble. So if anyone wants to demo it, use Chromium, not Iceweasel, if you can. I'll explain later. Um, there are a few JavaScript libraries that you need to have on your server. All of these JavaScript libraries, uh, jQuery, jQuery UI, Arbiter, they're already packaged on Debian. However, for people who aren't using the Debian platform, I did write a script to be able to grab this third-party JavaScript. So you need your web browser that works with RTC, the JavaScript libraries, and then insert the HTML for JS Communicator, the HTML and the JavaScript, on your web page. You can use a server-side include if that makes it even easier. It would be adding a line of code to your web page, basically. And then you customize your config file to point to the server you're using, and also to customize the user experience. Uh, you can modify so much about the, the app on your config file, uh, what features you're going to be using, if you're going to be using call with video, if you want to use chat or not, an automatic login. It's all available through the, the config file. And there's an example to show you with, with good explanations about what each uh, attribute is for. So this, is an, this shows the extension I wrote for JS, for Xtuple. For those of you not familiar with Xtuple, it's an um, open source business management software. So if you install it, uh, the NPM package for the Xtuple JS communicator extension, it appears right up on the web app. Oh, I don't think it can be seen here. It's not, well, I can't show the entire screen here, but it, the JS communicator appears integrated into their web application. This is their mobile Xtuple web app. So of course I had to write the model and the view to adhere to Xtuple, um, Xtuple standards, but the JS communicator code in itself was not modified whatsoever. It, I just included that, included the folder in the source, and that was it. So what I did work on during the Google Summer of Code, I did go through the wish list, fixed a few issues on the JS communicator. Just uh, some little features that make it a lot more user friendly. So I went going through that and some of the features that I'm, I guess, most proud of, I added agnostic internationalization support. A while ago, another student had contributed a French translation, a French uh, internationalization function. But this was only for the French language. I just turned it into an agnostic feature, which in my opinion is easy enough for someone with no tech uh, experience to handle. All you need is a messages properties file, dot properties file with your translation. X would be the code, your language code. And add an element to the available languages XML. With only the properties file, that's already enough for the browser to look at your own preferences. If you have a language preference, preference that has a corresponding properties file, it'll be loaded immediately. The XML is to load a, a menu with available languages, as can be seen in rtc.debian.org which can be changed at any moment while you're running the app. So I customize the UI a bit. This is, I'm not colorblind, but I'm kind of bad at colors. But I made a skin file that can be easily modified to change the color and appearance of JS Communicator. It's easy to insert your icons, your, your brand, whatever you'd like. And I also added an IAM component. The IAM component uses SIP simple messaging. We are discussing uh, 
migrating this to use XMPP so it will be more compatible with other applications that use XMPP. But right now, it works like a charm. And um, if you try testing it, when you call, it will automatically start a chat session. Um, of course, offline messages wouldn't work on this. And there, there's still plenty more to be done. It's still pretty raw, but it's very functional in its simplicity. So um, if we'd like to demo and try make, performing a call, any of you who have signed in, like I said, to rtc.debian.org can try. I put iSweasel here after 24, but I've experienced a bit of trouble with that. Basically, it's because of how iSweasel's been handling um, ICE, which is the Internet Connectivity Establishment. When it checks, when it runs a connectivity check, something goes wrong using iSweasel, so we're still figuring that out. So I prefer if you use Chromium or Firefox itself. I'm going to try to demo something live here to call uh, Martin Zobel here from the crowd. We can do just an audio. All right, well, let me try calling my compatriot, Tercero. Can I try calling you? Well, I'll call Zobel. He'll be able to see my camera, but I won't be able to see his. If someone calls you um, using a, if someone calls you with a video call, you can answer with video or without. It can just be an audio call. I'm using free phone box net. These are anonymous phone calls, which is why we didn't enable the chat option. Because we don't want just random people popping you up on chat. So I'll try calling Zobel. Are you in? All right. There are a lot of things I'd like to still implement. For example, uh, if you're running it on Chrome or Chromium, uh, stream negotiation is possible. As in, you can turn on your webcam on. You can turn your webcam on or off at any moment during the call. Right now, it's, it doesn't work that way. Once you turn it on, if you're doing an audio call, it's just audio. Video, it's just video. So uh, let me try here. Oh, here's the the language. Right now, we have English, French, Spanish, Portuguese. Hebrew, German, we have more than what's here. We have Czech, we have Polish, we have Slovak. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. But we've been getting lots of contributions with translations. It's been really, really exciting. So can I call you, Martin? All right. Dot org. So I'll try a video call here. It should ask for my permission at some point. Sorry, am I doing this right? I don't know why this isn't working. All right. So apparently it's calling you. I don't know if it's a video call yet. I think not. Oh, I clicked the wrong one. Let me try. Let me try calling you video, so so we can see if this works. Here. Debian not work. I know. I've been clicking it. I know, isn't that strange? Well, that's so strange, I just try calling. Well, <laughs> either way, let me work that out that bug before we try this out. Oh, it's possible? Oh boy, I'll turn this off. <laughs> okay, if, if, I don't have, if I don't have the camera enabled here, it could have been that, that it automatically didn't block. Oh, uh, microphone. I don't know if I have uh, access to the webcam here. It didn't ask for my permission yet, so I'm not sure because this isn't my laptop. But if any of you want to try it out, it should be fully functional because I just run some tests on it. So um, that's more or less it. Let me see here. Um, uh, of course, I really need to thank my mentor who is absent, unfortunately, Daniel Pocock, who is definitely a great mentor put up with stupid questions and constant <coughs> questions all throughout Google Summer of Code and before when I was working with him. I also want to thank uh, Martin Zobel and Tolif who set up the test servers during our development and a series of people, I can't remember all the names, who contributed with the translations. Uh, Daniel Pocock has a lot of posts about JS Communicator and WebRTC, uh, how to set up Reciprocate on your machine, um, what works and what doesn't right now, what we plan on doing. And I've also been writing some posts on my blog. I, I'm kind of owing a lot of posts. But it explains how the JS Communicator architecture is. Am I calling you again? Oh, 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and it, it also talks about like what I've been doing and what I plan to do next. I think that's it. That's all I have to say. Are there any questions? Um, okay, so uh, I don't. I understand that you use a web socket between the server and uh, between the clients, actually. Um, but um, what exactly is the SIG? S I C. What What does it stand? Yeah, S I P. Well, SIP is the protocol that's used for the communication. So what does it stand for? Um, session initiation protocol, I think. And um, uh, why do you need to use uh, that? Why not just use web sockets? Well, I believe that SIP has the entire structure for beginning a secure uh, connection and transmitting the audio and video um, data. Awesome. And I'm not a pro, so if anyone wants to answer this better than me. Sure. Uh, so one of the reasons why you would want to use SIP is that SIP actually allows you to integrate with uh, non web socket and non. So you can you can use the SIP client for this. So just a normal VoIP phone and and so on. Thank you, Paul. Uh, there was someone else. I have to stand up. Uh, yeah. So uh, I tried this uh, when Daniel showed us last year, and uh, it was all jolly good. And uh, I tried saying reciprocate on my server. Uh, but the, the bit nobody mentions is you need two IP addresses available, um, which so you said it's dead easy to set up reciprocate. Well, kind of, but most people haven't got a spare IP address, um, which uh, is a bit of a. And I'm not quite sure whether I can still use it at all with just one IP address, and I just don't get turn working properly. If anyone knows, who actually understands this stuff. Yeah, um, so I, I didn't work on reciprocate right, so in you particular. Know that bit. I know yeah. that I did. You did the front end thing. Install it on my own server, on my own machine, and I did have some trouble at the beginning. That too. Yeah. So that's actually a great question. Someone, um, someone have an answer to this? It's, it's, it's I the. I think I might have a partial answer. Um, I don't know enough to know if my answer is correct. Yeah. As a frequent SIP user, I often choose first my provider, and then uh, make arrangements with them of where they will forward my calls so I can have it come up on my N900 or my soft phone on my computer or on a hard uh, analog ATA uh, device that I keep at home connected to my network by a hard uh, a wire. So I don't, does that a partial answer to your question? So yeah, the point is that's, that's the client end. It's reciprocate means you're actually your own SIP provider. That's the missing piece. You don't have to use somebody else. So in theory, just like you run your own email server, you can run your own SIP server. Um, but that's that's the point where you now need slightly more tech. Um, when I've asked questions about that kind of peer-to-peer -peer communication, people then talk about PBX servers, and then I run away. <laughs> Anybody else? Actually, I'm a little relieved, but I'll do a last call. Are we good? I mean, I'll be available and walking around, I'm short, but you can spot me. So if there's anything else you'd like to discuss, I'll be around until Friday morning. And yeah, I'd love to talk to you about it and answer any questions I'm capable of. Oh. Um, one simple question. Uh, is everything, uh, JSC, SIP communicator, everything already included in, in Debian? So all the third-party software is included in Debian, all the packages you need. Um, you just basically need to download the code from the, from the GitHub repository, so I think so. I don't think it's available as a Debian package just yet, but it could be. Uh, I mean, for, for JSSIP and the communicator, is it not in? JSSIP, I believe, is. I believe they made one recently, but I, I could be wrong. If not, I mean, the code grabber downloads all the code you need. Okay. But I, I believe it is. And if it wasn't before, it is now. So it may have been something recent. Oh, 
think that's it. Thank you. As Andrew Sherman, I'm uh, one of the Google Summer of Code students. Um, over the summer, I've created a project that I've named uh, Recursively Building Java Applications. So before I actually go into and describe my project, let me just motivate um, what the project is about. Um, so Maven, if some of you don't know, it's a make-like, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> It's a make-like um, build system for Java projects, which allows you to, um, uh, well, build Java ap applications. But what it also does, it allows you to um, define dependencies within the uh, POM file or this, um, this, this make file. Um, but the key point being, it allows you to actually download these dependencies. Um, my mentor, Daniel Pocock, he, actually tried to um, upload an artifact to one of the central repositories. And um, the central repository are public repositories. They're kind of like Debian. They have people who manage them. And uh, you have to go through third parties to actually upload artifacts. But the artifact that he wanted to upload, it, they only required a POM file, a make file, and a jar file. So there's really no assurance that these, uh, or that this, jar file actually is being described by this POM file. Or um, put another way, for free software, uh, the big question is, can we really trust these dependencies? Um, so my project tries to uh, answer that question, as well as determining if the dependencies that your project actually depends on are free. And that is, if they uh, provide all the, all the source. So. Yeah, so my project, it's, um, it's a Maven plugin. Um, and uh, what it does, it, instead of actually d downloading these dependencies, it downloads the source for the dependencies and, actually, and builds them. So let me just tell you how, a little bit how it works. Um, essentially, it takes this, uh, it gets the POM file, this make file, it, and from this, it's able to build this artifact graph um, so from here you can uh, you create the graph of all the build dependencies, all the compile dependencies, all the um, um, pretty much everything you need to actually build the project, and um, and then tries to build it. Obviously, you may not want to actually build everything in the project. For example, the build plugins you may not want to build, so um, you can you can obviously uh, ignore them, but. Uh, um, the choice is yours, the plugin is configurable. Um, and of course, once you have that graph, you can obviously just try and build, it, build the actual project. So building actual, the actual project, um, you need source. And to get the source, well, the POM file, it has this information here. Some, some of the POM files have this information here. And um, as you can see, you can see the, uh, the actual version control system. And the URL you use to actually get access to the uh, repository. Um, so, yeah, you can get the source somewhere, at least for most um, artifacts. So, once you, get the, once you get the source, obviously you have to build it. And for my system, uh, or rather, for the main repository, even though it's a really main repository, there's no restriction that these artifacts are actually Maven artifacts. And um, that's why I had to support two different build systems. And these two different build systems, Maven and Nat, are the ones that I've seen as the fairly dominant ones. Um, so my system supports both these build systems. It, uh, when it builds the source, it builds using either Maven and Nat, depending on uh, uh, what type of build file it sees. Uh, either um, and if it has a build XML or uh, maybe if it has a POM file. Um, there's some conflict resolutions in there and, and so forth. So, um, but yeah. The question is, or there's still another question, and that is what happens when you can't access this information? Or that information. Um, say, for example, the uh, repository is behind an authentication wall where you don't have access, or 
the repository, the artifact is so old that the repository doesn't exist anymore, or maybe it's moved. Um, in central, there's no way to update that information. It's stuck there for forever, essentially. Um, so the other potential solution for that is getting these attached sources drugs. Um, these sources jars are kind of like uh, jar sidecar files. They contain most of the source that was used to build the actual project. Um, I say most of the source because generally uh, generated sources are not included in the source. And, uh, there really is no, uh, some companies may decide not to distribute all the source. Uh, there's a lot of reasons. Anyways, um, these files are generally not used for uh, building a project. But they're generally sort of developing, but I've essentially take, taken these uh, source files and uh, dumped them into the main line structure and used the palm file that comes, that describes the, the uh, sources file as a means for building it. Um, yeah. So what is the output of my, um, my plug? You get a mailing repository as an output. And why a mailing repository? Because you can actually use that to continue building um, out of plugins. So you make this repository. Uh, even Debian has a mailing like repository in it. Um, so essentially, what you could potentially do is build a repository and just uh, move that into Debian or, um, or something like that. Oh, it's just not that simple. There's a lot of more considerations again to, get to uh, 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 consider. But yeah, um, the other thing is you get a Git repository of the source. So in some cases, uh, manual intervention is required to actually fix some of the problems in the source tree. Uh, for example, the sources artifact may not have all the sources, or maybe. In any case, you may not be able to build a source with the default uh, mechanisms that I have implemented myself. And you have the ability to actually go back uh, into, uh, into the source, change it, run the plugin again, and then make it work. Um, but yeah, the most important thing is that this system is based on plugin architecture. So if it doesn't do what you, what you want, you can actually extend it. Create new build systems. If you found that um, ads and naming weren't good enough, you can change those up. If you found another way to get a uh, source that's not from the SCM information, that's not from um, a sources jar, then you can extend it. Um, so, yeah, I have a quick demo. version here, 154. So, 
this Nexus instance is set up to clone or mirror the actual public repository. Um, so you can see here that it is actually a public artifact. Success, everything's fine. Um, test run. Uh, if we go back here and actually try and build it, it should work, but unfortunately, it doesn't because there's, there is um, a test failure that is as a result of what I've done. Um, or rather, one of the tests that actually um, should work doesn't actually work on this particular system. So yeah, there's a couple of failures there, but um, in general, this type of this mechanism for actually uh, uh, building or creating these uh, 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 artifacts from source is, it works. In most cases, you'll be able to rebuild this. I've been semi-successful in what I've done. I've tried it on this, um, but unfortunately, I have larger projects, like uh, our larger project with the, with the huge dependency tree. I've not been as successful because um, uh, various things. Uh, there's obviously a lot of moving parts in the system, and trying to make all of them uh, run at the same rate is very difficult. Uh, so yeah, there are a few issues there that still get to be done. So here, uh, let me just show you. Uh, actually, no, I can't. Uh, so the plugin currently have, is able to create a minimum repository, but it's only able to do so locally. Uh, one of the features that I'm looking to uh, do in the future is actually upload those artifacts to a uh, some other repository. In this case, I have Nexus set up to deploy those to Nexus and uh, be done with them. But uh, in this case, you, uh, it's not able to do that just yet. Uh, yeah, I think that 
that's pretty much it for uh, my plug. Do you guys have any questions? Uh, there is no way uh, to ensure its authenticity. Uh, so, how is that true? Means uh, you, for example, you have a Maven repo. You always have a, a SHA file associated with it mm -hmm. to authenticate uh, the jar. Yeah, I saw in the poem that you're using the version control system to get the source, right? Mm -hmm. um, is there a way for a Maven repository to include also the source code and maybe pull it from there? That's kind of what the source of jar does, except it doesn't really do it completely. Um, it's pretty much one jar per artifact. Uh, but there are some jars that you just, or some artifacts that you can't put source to. Uh, I think the default behavior for creating those jars excludes um, images of a bunch of other junk. And it will, essentially, it only includes the, the, the Java files. For example, you have to do something extra if you're working in Groovy and wanted to include the .Groovy files. So we still have time for questions, so is there any more question? Well, thanks. So uh, while Kumar sets up, uh, he will talk to us about so. Hello? So there we go. Hello. Uh, I'm going to give presentation on Little Debbie that is running Debian on Android. So the basic principle is that uh, <coughs> we can run Debian OS, uh, uh, Debian OS on Android using chroot. After that, the Debian can start its own services like SSH, Samba, and all. These services are accessible through Android also. Example, if you start OpenSSH uh, in Debian, then after that you can access the, you can directly do SSH using phone's IP. But actually you will go inside the Debian shell, but like uh, uh, as an example, you can, uh, you cannot distinguish between the services. Uh, by far you cannot distinguish services started by Android or Debian. You can access through external world also, or even Android can access the Debian services. So its important parts are installing Debian, starting Debian, and stopping Debian. For installation, we create an image file. And after that, we create Linux and Android mount points so that the Debian itself can access the slash data, SD card, and all those stuff. 
After that, we debootstrap Debian rootfs from the Debian servers. So, and after that, we uh, uh, set up the stop scripts because if uh, Debian try to haul the system, then actually it sends a haul signal to Android also. So Android also shut down. So we have to set up stop script in such a way that only the Debian services are stopped, not the Android services. And for starting, we first mount the image file. After that, we mount all the Debian uh, devices in uh, uh, Android devices in Debian. And we directly do the ch root and start the basic services which we need. For stopping, we just stop all the Debian processes. We check if there is any open files in the Debian. And we unmount all the Android devices and we unmount the image file. So, like. Hello? Uh, uh, with this, we check whether the image is validated or not using uh, uh, by, uh, uh, calculating its checksum uh, before starting the image. Uh, with this option, we can uh, install the Debian directly inside the data partition so that uh, it's not, uh, we don't have to depend upon mounting of the SD card. And we don't have to provide the size of the image at the start. So it's directly accessible into the Android file system itself. And automatically starting Debian means uh, uh, whenever our Android boots up, we can configure that uh, when the booting is completed, the Android services get started. Or if it is installed in SD card, then after SD card mounting is completed, the Debian starts up. And we can set, set up our own uh, post start and pre stop scripts. Uh, like uh, by default, I have set up RC2 for start and RC0 for stop. Uh, the, de the demo will uh, give most of, the, most of it. Like the demo is not much fancy. You can see. It's not much like there is an install button there. After installation, we have to provide options that what release we want, stable, unstable, testing, Weasley, and all. And uh, we have to provide the mirror, which mirror we want to use, and which architecture. Currently, we support ARML and ARMHF. And we have to provide the size of the image. Uh, when the installation starts, the uh, all the process, the, uh, the script does the work that is creating the image file, uh, debootstrapping, and setting up the stop script. After that, we get a start Debian button. We can start the Debian, and uh, the Debian is running. After that, uh, in the option, we can open the terminal and run the commands. Um, I have demo running on my phone also. I'm accessing through Wi-Fi, so it's a bit slow. So this is a start button. So the Android started. The options like open terminal, preference, delete all my setup and preferences. In the preferences, I can uh, choose the option that start automatically 
check uh, check the checksum image path and all automatically start prevent from sleeping install on internal storage checksum image on start hello hello or uh, image path post start script and pre stop script I open the terminal. You cannot see it, but I can run the basic Linux commands on it. The phone is not slow, but uh, the connection between the laptop and phone is slow. If anyone wants to try, um, I can show you on my mobile after the presentation. so the use case might be uh, uh, you can install python development uh, environment directly on your tablet you don't have to carry your laptop and all uh, even you can run a wordpress server on your older phone and the source code is available on github the project was started by a guardian project group so the link is github.com/guardianproject/littlelevy and the future scope is running ubuntu uh, uh providing support like selecting the file system which you uh, the image file which you want to cre create that is for ext2 34 or uh, yaffs2 and adding support for non rooted phones the uh, the application currently supports only rooted phones any questions When Debian starts up, does it run its own init process or does it use the Android init? And if it uses the Android init, is that good enough? No, actually, uh, it doesn't start, runs the init command. It depends, uh, like, the init, init process initializes all the basic environment required for an operating system to start up. Uh, the, this work is already done by the Android it just only use like uh, the debian has all the proc and slash dev from the android so it can use those services direct of the android itself it doesn't run its own in it Could you please go over the use case slide one more time? Yes. to run graphical applications from the Chirut? No, not right now. Uh, like via VNC or something like that, maybe? I have not there, tried it. C can you imagine that it might work somehow? Uh, uh, not currently, I can, not currently right now. How do I install it in my phone? How to install How, it? Yeah. On the phone, uh, Little Baby is directly available on the Play Store. Is it? Can you make it available on my F Droid as well? Yes. Uh, I guess. The latest version there is from available. January. Oh. <laughs> so let's. I will check it if it's not there. I will upload it. It's. 0 0.4.6 from January 2014. I cannot search it. 
Yeah, it's that. Uh, we are about to release a new version, so we will make sure it's available on here also. So we still have time for questions, if there are any. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I guess this is time to close the session. I would like one, to... One minute. Oh, uh, yeah. If uh, like, such thing is interesting for you, my earlier project was running two different um, Android instances simultaneously on... Actually, I tried it on emulator, not on the phone. So it was like running two Android instances simultaneously on an emulator. So the project was named Alexi on Android. So Check that video also. My content. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank, uh, first of all, Google, who uh, sponsored the, um, the projects that Debian had this summer. I would like to thank all the students. Uh, we did some great work this summer. All the mentors uh, that have been tireless in supporting the students. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, my co-admin, Sylvestre, who can be here today because he's waiting for well, a happy event. So thanks, everyone. We all students even want to thank Debian, Google for all this up platform they have provided us and even the lot of helpful mentors we got to work with during the summer. So thanks.